Shall we bow our heads for prayer? What a wonderful day this has been, O loving Heavenly Father. And now we have the opportunity of culminating or reaching the climax of this day through the study of your Holy Word. And the subject that we're going to study today is extremely solemn and important. And we know that we can't understand it without the aid of your Holy Spirit. So we ask, Father, that through the ministration of your Spirit, you will come to be with us in this place. You will also be with all of those who are watching this program on the different channels on television. I ask, Lord, that through your Spirit, you will speak clearly and distinctly to each heart. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to begin by reading the verses that we've been studying in the last several sessions. Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This is the third imperative in the first angel's message that we're going to take a look at in our study today. First imperative is, fear God. The second imperative is, give glory to Him. And the third, of course, is worship Him who made the heaven, earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Now the first thing that we want to ask is, who was this creator that is mentioned in the first angel's message? Well, go with me to Colossians chapter 1, and we'll read verses 15 through 17. Colossians chapter 1 and verses 15 through 17. Here it's speaking about Jesus Christ. And notice what it says. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, that is by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Now that expression, in him all things consist, means that he holds creation together. In him all things hold together. That's the way that it's translated, for example, in the New International Version. And so the Bible is very clear that the Creator, who is mentioned in the first angel's message, was none other than Jesus Christ himself. But now we must ask the question, why does Jesus command us to worship him? Notice Psalm 95 and verse 6. Here is the motivation or the reason why Jesus calls upon us to worship Him. It says in Psalm 95, verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. So the motivation for worship is the fact that He is the Creator and we are His creatures. Worship is due from us because we were created by Jesus Christ. Let's notice one other verse that speaks about the motivation for worship. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Nehemiah 9 and verse 6. Here, Nehemiah, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. Notice the similar idea to Colossians chapter 1. He's also the preserver or the one who holds everything together. 
And now notice how verse 6 ends. The host of heaven, what? The host of heaven worships you. So what is the motivation for worship? The fact that God alone is the Lord, and He made the heavens and everything that is in them. Now, in order to understand the first angel's message then, we have to go back to the story of creation. Because the first angel's message says, the reason why you're supposed to worship Jesus, or worship God, is because He's the Creator. So the first angel's message obviously sends us back to Genesis, to the story of creation. In other words, we cannot understand the first angel's message without going back to Genesis chapter 1 and also chapter 2. So let's go back there to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, and we'll read through chapter 2 and verse 1. I want you to notice several interesting details here. It says, Then God saw everything that He had made. Who had made? God. Who specifically? Jesus. Then God saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were what? Finished. I want you to remember that word. Finished. Let me ask you, what day did Jesus finish his work of creation? He finished the sixth day. The word finished is used. Who did all of the work the first six days? Jesus did all of the work. Did human beings do any of the work? Did Adam and Eve do any of the work? Absolutely not. It says clearly, then God saw everything that he had made, and then it says that he finished the sixth day, saw that it was good, and his works were finished. But now we need to talk about the day after the sixth day. Let's talk about the seventh day. Go with me to Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3. And I want us to notice several interesting things in these two verses. And on the seventh day... God ended His work, which He had done. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work, which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work, which God had created and made. Now here's my question. Once again, this passage tells us that who did all of the work? Jesus did all of the work. God did all of the work. It's repeated time and again. It says on the seventh day God ended His work, which He had done. He rested. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work, which God had created and made. In other words, once again, it's repeated that the person who created everything during the first six days was whom? Was God or, as we read at the beginning of our presentation, Jesus Christ. But now I want you to notice another very interesting detail in this passage of Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. Let's go once again and read the passage, and I'm going to underline two key words. It says, And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had done, and He rested, notice, He rested, on the seventh day from all his work which he had done, and don't miss this next word, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. When did God bless and sanctify the seventh day? It was after he what? After he rested. In other words, what made the Sabbath holy? The fact that God or Jesus what? Rested on the Sabbath. And in case you didn't get it from where it says, then, after he rested, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, we're told again, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. In other words, Jesus did all of the work the first six days, and then Jesus rested the seventh day, and when the seventh day ended, Jesus blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified the seventh day. 
Now we need to ask the question, what did Jesus do on the seventh day? You know, for a long time I had had uh, an enigma in my mind about the book of Genesis, particularly about the seventh day. You know, you read the story of creation and God's rest on the seventh day, and it never says in the creation story that Jesus told Adam and Eve to keep the Sabbath. And I always wondered about that. There are other places in the Bible that uh, show that the Sabbath originally was made for man. Nevertheless, I always wondered why in the Genesis account it doesn't say God told Adam and Eve to keep the Sabbath. Now, I want you to put that enigma on hold because we're going to come back to it. I want to go to another verse now that corroborates the idea that we just noted in Genesis where it says that Jesus rested or God rested and after he rested the whole day, Then he blessed and sanctified the day. Let's go to the fourth commandment of God's holy law. And by the way, the first angel's message is referring to, with its language, to Exodus chapter 20, the fourth commandment. By the way, what I'm going to read was spoken by God's own voice, and it was written by his own finger on tables of stone. So we must listen. It says in Exodus 20, verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Jews. No, it says, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. We're going to notice the reason why. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For, now comes the reason. Why are we supposed to work six days and rest the seventh? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and don't miss this now, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it or made it holy. Is is this very clear? that God or Jesus rested the seventh day and then Jesus blessed the seventh day and made it holy? Yes or no? Absolutely. So this first week of the history of the world is what I call God's week or Jesus' week. You see, it's God's week before it becomes man's week because God is the one who works six And God is the one who rested on the seventh day. In other words, the first week is all about God. The first week does not deal primarily with man. In other words, God, among other things, created the week by working six days and by resting on the seventh day. You know, as I studied this out, I discovered the reason why God did not command Adam and Eve to keep that first Sabbath holy. You say, well, what is the reason? Listen, folks, we just noted in Scripture that the day did not become holy until it was over. Jesus didn't make the Sabbath holy until the day ended. So how could he tell Adam and Eve when the Sabbath was beginning, keep the Sabbath holy if it wasn't holy yet? Furthermore, how could God tell Adam and Eve, keep the Sabbath and follow my example if God or Jesus had not first given the example. Furthermore, and this is a very important point, the Sabbath that God commanded man to keep was not the first Sabbath of human history, but starting with the second Sabbath of human history. And you say, how is that? This might be new to you. Even if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, it might be new to you. But it's biblical, and it's powerful, and it explains why God did not command Adam and Eve to keep that first Sabbath, but rather the second Sabbath. What does the fourth commandment say? The fourth commandment makes the Sabbath a creation ordinance, because it sends you back to creation. It explains that you keep the Sabbath because of creation. Now, it's very interesting that God says in the fourth commandment to man, work six and what? Rest on the seventh. Now, here's my question. When that first Sabbath came, had man worked six days? He had not worked six days. So could he keep the commandment technically that says, work six and rest the seventh? No. 
Jesus worked six, he rested the seventh, and then the fourth commandment says that he told Adam and Eve and all of their descendants, now as you saw me work six and rest on the seventh, you work six and you rest the next seventh day. So after Jesus made the Sabbath holy, after Jesus gave the example, then he gives the fourth commandment which says, keep the Sabbath day holy because now after I rested, the Sabbath is holy. Holy. So let me ask you, whose day is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is the day of whom? Of Jesus before it is the day of man. The week was created by Jesus and then the week was given to man after it was created by Jesus. By the way, Seventh-day Adventists are not the only ones that believe that the Sabbath is a creation ordinance. Let me read you a statement from an evangelical scholar. Uh, his name is Henry Morris. I'll be saying a little bit more about him a little bit later. Notice what he says. This is in the book Biblical Creationism, page 62. The Lord himself had worked six days, then rested on the seventh, setting thereby a permanent pattern for the benefit of mankind. What did God do? What did Jesus do when he created the week? He established a permanent what? A permanent pattern for man to follow the same process or procedure as God. So let me ask you, did the Sabbath then become a sign of God the creator for man? The fourth commandment says yes, because the motivation for keeping the Sabbath is because of creation. So as soon as the first week ended, Jesus says to man, now you're going to work six, and the next seventh day you're going to come, and we're going to keep the Sabbath the way you saw me keep this first Sabbath. And in this way, from then on, you are going to remember that I am the creator. The Sabbath will be the sign that I am the creator. And you will remember it from then on. Incidentally, that's the reason why the fourth commandment begins by saying, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In fact, the Bible tells us that the Sabbath is a sign between God and his people. And I want you to remember this because we're going to come back to it in later lectures. Exodus 31, verse 17. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 17. God says, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. You say, well, that was for the children of Israel. But do you know that the New Testament says that those who are Christ's are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? You can read it in Gal Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. If you are Christ, you're Abraham's seed. If you're Christ, you are Israel. And so it says, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. And then it says, he says why it's a sign. Notice, for, that is because, in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was what? He rested and was refreshed. So let me ask you, was the Sabbath a creation institution? It most certainly was a creation institution. It predates the Jews. It has nothing to do in its original intention with redemption at the cross. Because the Sabbath was created in a perfect world. It has nothing to do with redemption with the cross in its original intention. Later it takes on a secondary function. But from the beginning, it points towards creation. So the first angel's message, when it tells us to worship the Creator, is sending us back to Genesis, and we notice that the sign of the Creator is the observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath. Now allow me to read you a few other statements, amazing statements from Henry Morris, who is an evangelical scholar. By the way, he passed away uh, in 2006. He's a staunch he was a staunch defender of a six-day literal creation, and he was the founder of the Institution for Creation Research in San Diego, California. Notice what he says. Biblical creationism, pages 61 and 62. The observance of the Sabbath day, that is rest day, was not instituted by this commandment. That is by the fourth commandment. He says the Sabbath was not instituted by the fourth commandment. For it had been practiced by mankind ever since the actual week of creation, when God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he had rested from all his work which God created and made. On page 251, he says this, not only is there considerable evidence that Sabbath observance existed in both Israel and in other nations long before Moses, 
But the Word of God makes it plain that it was established by God Himself in commemoration of His completed creation and that it has been observed as a, a special day of rest at least by some ever since. In another quotation, page 253 of the book Biblical Creationism, he says, with the passing of the centuries, the Sabbath eventually became almost exclusively associated with the religious ceremonies of the nation of Israel. Even though the Creator had hallowed it originally for all men, when the Creator eventually became man, however, in the person of Jesus Christ, he stressed that it had never been intended as a mere Jewish religious ritual, as the Pharisees had distorted it, but it was made for the good of all men. Those are amazing statements from an evangelical scholar who's saying that the Sabbath is a creation institution and it was kept by the human race long before the existence of Moses or the existence of the Ten Commandments. But now we need to move forward. Let's talk about the exodus of Israel from Egypt. You remember the sign that God gave to mark the exodus from Egypt? It was the Passover, right? Now let me ask you, who was it that delivered Israel from bondage in Egypt and established the institution of the Passover? Go with me to Exodus chapter 3 and verses 13 and 14. This is happening at the burning bush. There's a majestic being that comes to speak with Moses. I want you to notice the terminology that is used. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Who was it that appeared in the burning bush? What was his name? His name was I am. And he says, I have been sent to deliver Israel from Egypt. Now, if you read Exodus 20, verse 1, which is the preamble to the Ten Commandments, it says there, I am the Lord your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Let me ask you, was the giver of the Ten Commandments the same one who appeared in the burning bush? Yes, because at the burning bush, he says, I'm going to deliver you. When the, when the Ten Commandments are given, he says, I am the one who delivered you. Now the question is, who was this that appeared in the burning bush who said, I'm going to deliver you, and also gave the Ten Commandments? Let's go to John chapter 8, verses 58 and 59. John chapter 8, verses 58 and 59. Jesus is entertaining a conversation with the Jews. Notice what it says here. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. What was Jesus claiming when he said, before Abraham was, I am? He was saying, I was the one who appeared where? In the burning bush. Did the Jews know that he was claiming that? You better believe it. Notice verse 59. It says there in verse 59, then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Let me ask you then, who delivered Israel from Egypt? Jesus. Who was the one who gave the Ten Commandments? Jesus. Who was the one who created this world, worked six days, and rested on the seventh, and by his rest he made the Sabbath holy, and then gave it to man along with the week? Who was it? It was Jesus Christ. So the Sabbath belongs to Jesus. The deliverer of Israel was Jesus. In other words, the Creator is also the Redeemer of Israel. Let me ask you, was that the same person who came to deliver the human race from bondage? Go with me to John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and then we'll read verse 14. This is one of the ones that's not on your list, but uh, you know it so well that probably you don't even have to look it up. John 1, verses 1 to 3, and verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Who is this? Who is the Word? Jesus. Now notice, all things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. Was Jesus the Creator? Yes, He was. Was He also the Redeemer? 
Notice verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Was Jesus the fulfillment of the Passover lamb? Absolutely. And so you have an unbroken chain of creation, redemption of Israel, and the Redeemer of the human race being whom? Being Jesus Christ. Now, if you examine the story of the Bible, you'll find that the Passover lamb needed to have two characteristics. First of all, the Passover, Passover lamb had to be perfect and without blemish. And then when it was determined that the lamb was perfect and without blemish, the lamb was then sacrificed. Now, let me ask you, what did this represent? The perfect unblemished lamb. It represented the perfect life of Jesus Christ as that he lived on this earth. And what did the death of the lamb represent? The death of the lamb represented the death of Jesus bearing our, bearing our sins on the cross. In other words, the Passover had a much greater dimension to it than just sacrificing a lamb and eating bitter herbs and partaking of unleavened bread. The sign that Jesus gave to Israel was fulfilled in himself when he came to this world. But now we need to ask the question, what day and hour did Jesus die as the Passover lamb? Go with me to Matthew 27 and verses 46 and 47. We're going to notice something very interesting here. Don't you go to sleep on me because this is going to get very interesting and very good. Matthew 27, verses 46 and 47. We're going to look at the last three sayings of Jesus on the cross. It says, And about the ninth hour, notice that it wasn't the ninth hour, it says about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's about the ninth hour. It's not the ninth hour yet. Because he still has some things to say. John 19 and verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, what? It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. But when you go to Luke, you discover that he said something after he said it is finished. In Luke 23, verse 46, it says, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, that's when he says, It is finished. He said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Let me ask you, what hour of the day do you think that Jesus breathed his last after saying, It is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Exactly at the, what hour? At the ninth hour. And you say, well, pastor, what is the ninth hour? Well, let's go to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 6. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 6. We're still dealing with the Sabbath. We'll come back to the Sabbath, but we need some background here. Exodus 12 and verse 6. It's speaking about the observance of the Passover. And it says this. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it, that is, kill the Passover lamb, when? At twilight. In Hebrew, it literally says, between the two evenings. You say, so the Jews had two evenings? Absolutely. You say, what were the two evenings? The first evening is when the sun reaches the meridian and it st starts its downward course. And by the way, I know that scientifically the sun doesn't move. But we're speaking in the manner that we usually speak. When the sun reaches its summit and begins its descent, that is when the afternoon begins. You know, even in Spanish, when, when we get to the hours of the afternoon, we say, tarde. Right? In other words, the, the, the first evening is when the sun begins setting from the meridian. The second evening is when the sun actually sets at sundown. Now the question is, what would be between the two evenings? Between the two evenings would be the ninth hour or three o'clock. Because the ninth hour was three o'clock. Third hour was nine o'clock. That's when Jesus was crucified. The sixth hour would have been noon, and the ninth hour was at three o'clock in the afternoon. 
In other words, Jesus died at the precise moment that the Passover lamb was supposed to be what? Was supposed to be sacrificed. Three o'clock on what Christians call Good Friday. Now I want to read a passage in Scripture that gives us the sequence of days of the Passion of Christ. I want to show you that Jesus died on Friday. He was buried in the tomb and remained in the tomb all day Sabbath. And he resurrected on the first day of the week. Luke 23, verses 54 to 56. Here you find the chronological sequence. We know that he died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Which day? Let's notice. That day, this is when Jesus was crucified and died, that day was the preparation. And the Sabbath drew near. So had the Sabbath begun yet? No. It was Friday. Verse 55. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. What did the ladies do outside the tomb? They what? They rested. Let me ask you, was there an urgency to get the body of Jesus off of the cross on Friday? Yes. Why was there urgency to get it off the cross? Because he could not be on the cross on the Sabbath. There's a deeper intent than that, than the legalism of the Jews. You see, when the Sabbath began, Jesus had to be already prepared, like the Passover lamb effort was killed, it had to be prepared, and then later on, probably at sundown, then they ate the Passover lamb. You see, Jesus died at 3 o'clock, his body needed to be prepared in order to be buried so that his body would rest in the tomb all of the day, Sabbath. In other words, Jesus did in redemption what he did at creation. On the cross, on the sixth day, he says, it is finished. We read the word finished in Genesis after six days of work. Jesus is saying, I have bought back the human race. I have paid the price of redemption. And then he breathed his last and he was put in the tomb and he rested in the tomb on Sabbath. Now in order to fully understand this, we need to go to Exodus chapter 16. The Sabbath in redemption. You see, there was a reason why Jesus had to remain in the tomb on the Sabbath. Exodus 16, 19 to 21. And Moses said, Let no one have any of it till morning. In other words, when the manna was picked up any day other than Friday for Sabbath, nobody was supposed to save any manna for the next day. Verse 20. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning. And what happened? When they left it any other day except Friday for Sabbath, what happened to the manna? Two things. It bred worms and it stank. And Moses was angry with them. Let me ask you, was this normal bread? No. What happens with normal bread if you leave it from one day to the next? Nothing, really. And even if you leave it a week, it just gets moldy. But it doesn't breed worms and stink. What is it that breeds worms and stinks? Flesh. Decomposing flesh. That's right. Now notice what happened when the manna was picked up on Friday for the Sabbath. Exodus 16, 23 and 24. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath for the Jews. Let me ask you, why is the Sabbath called the Sabbath of the Lord? Because the Lord kept it first. It's his day. And then he gave it to man. God says, it's mine before it was yours. Notice. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil, and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up until morning, this is on Friday when they're doing this, as Moses commanded, and it did not, what? Stink, nor were there any what? Any worms in it. Now, what was God trying to teach through the manna episode? Because the manna did not decompose when it was saved from Friday to Sabbath. Well, we need to know what the manna represents. Let's go to John chapter 6 and verse 51. You see, most commentators have missed this messianic dimension of the story of the manna. 
God is not only trying to teach that we're supposed to keep the Sabbath by the man episode, He's trying to teach that Jesus kept the Sabbath when He died on the cross and He rested in the tomb and His body saw no corruption. Notice John 6 and verse 51. Here Jesus is speaking. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. What does the manna represent? The what of Jesus? The flesh of Jesus. Well, let me ask you, when Jesus rested in the tomb on the Sabbath, did his flesh see any decay or decomposition? No, because he was the living manna. You see, as the manna, when was picked up on Friday, did not decompose on the Sabbath, Jesus died on Friday, and his body did not decompose on the tomb, or in the tomb on Sabbath, because he was the living manna. In fact, notice the prophecy that we find in Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10. This is not just something off the top of my head. The Bible teaches it. It says in Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10, this is a messianic prophecy. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also, notice, my flesh also will what? Will rest in hope. What happened with the flesh of Jesus? It what? It rested in hope. Why did it rest in hope? For you will not leave my soul in Sheol. I like the New International Version. It says you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption or decay, as it says in the New International Version. What happened when Jesus was put in the tomb? His body did not see what? Decay. What would have happened with a normal body? It would have begun the process of what? of decomposition, but not the body of Jesus, because he was the living manna. In other words, what God was trying to teach was this, that when Jesus rested in the tomb on the Sabbath, the Sabbath of Exodus chapter 16, his body would see no corruption, because he was the living manna. The emphasis falls upon the fact that he was going to rest on Sabbath from his works of redemption, and his flesh would not see corruption. In fact, let's notice the fulfillment of this as it's given in Acts chapter 2, verses 25 to 27 and verse 31. Acts 2, 25 to 27. Here, Psalm 16 that I just read is quoted. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, this is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. What was going to happen with the flesh of Jesus? It was going to what? Rest in hope. Notice, I'm reading from the NIV. You will not leave me in the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see decay. And then verses, verse 31 explains what was meant by this. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke, David spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. Was God trying to teach that the body of Jesus was going to rest in the tomb on Sabbath and it was not going to de decompose? Absolutely. So did Jesus do the same after he redeemed the human race as what he had done after creating the human race? Absolutely. What did he do? He rested on the seventh day. The whole seventh day because he was put in the tomb before the Sabbath began. And he remained in the tomb all day Sabbath. You know, some Christians say, well, you know, I prefer Sunday because, you know, Sunday was a happy day and the Sabbath was a sad day. It's amazing what kind of rational arguments people will come up with. The fact is that the Sab that Sabbath should have never been a sad day because Jesus had told them that he was going to go to Jerusalem, he was going to die, and he was going to resurrect the third day. If they'd listened to him, that day would have been a day of glorious anticipation. They would have understood that Jesus, the sixth day, said, I have finished the work of redemption. They would have said, now he's resting in the tomb. He said he's going to resurrect tomorrow. 
That would have been a day of joyous anticipation. And by the way, Sunday was no happy day because the night of Sunday, the disciples didn't even believe that Jesus had resurrected. So how could they be happy? So we need to be careful with rational arguments that people provide. If they truly had understood what God was trying to teach them through this prophecy of the rest of the body of Jesus in the tomb, the Sabbath would have been a glorious day. They would have understood the Messiah is resting from his works of redemption like he rested from his works of creation. You know, some Christians say, well, Jesus resurrected on Sunday because he wanted to, the church to know that Sunday was a special holy day. But now we see that the focus is not Sunday. The focus is what? The Sabbath. Listen, in order for Jesus to rest in the tomb all day Sabbath, he would have had to resurrect on Sunday. But the important thing is not his resurrection on Sunday. The important thing is his rest in the tomb on Sabbath. But Christians say, no, it's Sunday, Sunday that's important. No, no, it's his rest in the tomb. And therefore, because he had to rest in the tomb all day, he had to resurrect when? He had to resurrect on the first day of the week. It's amazing how during Holy Week, Christians speak about, you know, they say, Ash Wednesday and Holy Thursday and Good Friday. Resurrection, Su Resurrection Sunday, Palm Sunday. And whoever mentions the Sabbath? Nobody ever mentions the Sabbath during Holy Week. It kind of gets lost in the shuffle. So let's review. Jesus died at 3 o'clock on Friday, between the two evenings. His body was taken down from the cross and prepared for burial before the Sabbath began. Shortly before sundown, his body was put in the tomb. He rested from his works of redemption. And his body did not decompose because he was the living manna. And then Jesus resurrected on the first day of the week, not to make the first day of the week holy, but because the previous day he had to rest in the tomb on Sabbath. Let me ask you, what is it that makes the Sabbath holy? We read in the book of Genesis and also in the fourth commandment that what makes the Sabbath holy was the rest of Jesus. He rested, therefore he blessed and sanctified the day. Is that, is that what the Bible teaches? Absolutely. So what made the Sabbath holy? The rest of Jesus Christ. In order for you to say that Sunday is the holy day of rest, you would have to prove from Scripture that Jesus rested on the first day of the week. Because only his rest would make the day holy. But Jesus did not rest on the first day of the week. Jesus rested the Sabbath in the tomb like he did at creation, thus sanctifying the Sabbath. Now, folks, Satan has done his utmost to erase the memory of Jesus Christ from this world. He has sought to eradicate the sign of the Creator, the Sabbath, because it reminds us of Jesus, the Creator and the Redeemer. And so he has tried to erase the sign and in this way, erase in our memories the existence of Jesus and the importance of Jesus. You know, men have come up with all kinds of explanations for the existence of the world. Darwinian evolution, intelligent design, punctuated equilibrium, progressive creation, theistic evolution, new age theories. If people kept the seventh day Sabbath, none of these theories would be accepted. Because the Bible says that Jesus created the world in six days and he rested the seventh day. Period. That's what scripture says. The tragic truth, however, is that these philosophies that I just mentioned are no longer the belief system of secular humanists, skeptics, agnostics, atheists, materialists, and evolutionists. They have become the belief of the Christian church and even of some scholars within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Allow me to read you a statement from the Roman Catholic Catechism. This is the latest catechism, 1994, page 87. The Catholic Catechism leaves the door open for evolution. Notice what it says. God himself created the visible world in all its richness, diversity, and order. Scripture presents the work of the Creator. Now notice this, notice this word. It's very, it's very covert, but you need to read it. It says, Scripture presents the work of the Creator symbolically as a succession of six days of divine work. 
See, they're not literal, they're what? Symbolic. It's leaving the door open for evolution. So scripture presents the work of the creator symbolically as a succession of six days of divine work concluded by the rest of the seventh day. Do you know that John Paul II, who was greatly admired all over the world, not only opened the door, a little crack in the door, he opened the door wide. In fact, notice he gave a speech on October 22, 1996 to the Pontifical Academy of the Sciences, and he said this, It is indeed remarkable that this theory, that is evolution, has been progressively accepted by researchers following a series of discoveries in various fields of knowledge. The convergence of all of these scholars and their, and their uh, research, the convergence neither sought nor fabricated of the results of work that was conducted independently is in itself a significant argument in favor of this theory. Let me read you a newspaper column that speaks about this event, this speech that John Paul II gave. This uh, is from the Chicago Tribune, uh, October 25, 1996. In a major statement of the Roman Catholic Church's position on the theory of evolution, Pope John Paul II has proclaimed that the theory is more than just a hypothesis and that evolution is compatible with Christian faith. In a written message to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, the Pope said that the theory of evolution has been buttressed, that is strengthened, by scientific studies and discoveries since Charles Darwin. If taken literally, the biblical view of the beginning of life and Darwin's scientific view would seem irreconcilable. In Genesis, the creation of the world and Adam, the first human, took six days. Evolution's process of genetic mutation and natural selection, the survival and proliferation of the fittest new species, has taken billions of years according to the scientists. So basically, John Paul II has said that evolution is compatible with the Christian faith and that this world perhaps came into existence through the process of evolution. Do you know that there are many evangelical scholars that are teaching the same thing? Renowned evangelical scholars that are teaching the idea of progressive creation, that God used evolution as his method of creation. And that there was death long before sin. That God used the process of evolution, the survival of the fittest, animals killing animals, so that they could develop into higher species. What kind of God is a God who can't speak and things are done? Why does God have to use a process where there's death for millions of years before things come into existence? What kind of omnipotent God is that? I don't serve that kind of God. I serve a God of perfection. I don't serve a God who uses the system of trial and error to eventually create the world. Many scholars, even in the Adventist church, are reinterpreting the days of creation as long periods of time. Many of our own scholars are using the historical critical method. Some are even saying that Moses didn't write the book of Genesis. That it's the result of the work of several different authors. And they're saying that, yeah, Moses believed that the days of creation, or whoever wrote Genesis, believed that the days of creation are literal days. But Moses was wrong. Because science has proved him wrong. That's the idea that they're sharing. This in spite of the fact that there are powerful biblical arguments to show that the days of creation were literal days. First of all, if you read the, the main Hebrew lexicons, which are the dictionaries of Hebrew, for example... Holidays uh, Hebrew lexicon, Brown, Driver, and Briggs, which is probably the most famous Hebrew lexicon. They all say that Genesis, no matter what your interpretation is, they say that the author that wrote this believed that the, that the days were literal 24-hour days. Yeah, for example, in the story of creation, it says the evening and the morning of the first day. Boy, I'll tell you, does that mean the evening and the morning of the first million years? The expression evening and morning shows that it's literal. Furthermore, in the Old Testament, the, the, a, a number with a numeral adjective 
is used, uh, the word day, excuse me, with a numeral adjective, is used 150 times in the Old Testament. And every single time that the word day, yom, appears with a numeral adjective, it refers to a literal 24-hour day. And then what do you do with the fourth commandment? Fourth commandment says, you work six and work the, and rest the seventh because God worked six and rested the seventh. So if you make the original days million, dollar, mil, mil, million year days, what do you do with us following the example of the Creator? It breaks down. If we're supposed to work six literal days and keep the Sabbath, it's because originally God worked six literal days and kept the Sabbath, or else He would be asking us to keep an impossibility. It all boils down to whether you have faith or not. By faith we believe. And I'll tell you what. I choose to believe the story that God tells in His Holy Word. Do you think the devil is able to shift things around on the earth to make it appear that evolution is a plausible theory? You better believe he can. So all we can do is trust the Word of God. Now before we bring this to an end, I need to talk to you about the Sabbath in its future dimension. See, the Sabbath is not only a commemoration of Jesus as the Creator, it's not only a commemoration of Jesus as the Redeemer, it's also a prophecy about the future rest that we will have in the kingdom come. Notice Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. Isaiah 66, 22 and 23. It says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make... Notice he's going to make a new heavens and new earth, right? Right? For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass, when he makes the new heavens and new earth, according to the context, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, better translation would be from one month to another, because the new moon marks the beginning of the month, from one month to another. In Spanish, in fact, it says de mes en mes, from month to month. And from Sunday to Sunday... No, that's not what it says. It can't be Sunday because that's not the way day Jesus rested. It's his rest that makes the day holy. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Will the Sabbath be the sign of worship to the creator of the new heavens and new earth? Yes. So there are three reasons for keeping the Sabbath. One, because Jesus created the world. In six days, rest of the seventh. Because Jesus redeemed the world, and on the sixth day said, it is finished, and rested in the tomb on the Sabbath. And it points forward to the future, when after he makes a new heavens and a new earth, he will say, it is finished, and he will rest with his people in the kingdom come. Now you say, why does it say from one new moon to another, or from one month to another? Well, the reason is very simple. We're not only going to keep the Sabbath in the earth made new, we're also going to go every month to eat from a very peculiar tree. Notice Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, this is the New Jerusalem, in the middle of its street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every what? Every month. So do you know what we're going to do every month by going to worship before the Lord? To eat from the tree of life. To refurbish our battery or life force. And why are we going to go from Sabbath to Sabbath? In order to commemorate what? The new creation. And by the way, some people misunderstand a verse in the Bible, Revelation 21, 23, where it says, and I want to read it, it says, the city had no need of sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, the Lamb is its light. So they say, see, in the earth made new, there's not going to be any day or night. There's not going to be months, there's not going to be days. Yes, there are. If you're going to keep the Sabbath, there must be a week. If you're going to go from month to month, it must be that there are months, and if there are months, there are years. Hello? Are you all out there? What is Revelation 21, 23 saying? It's talking not about the earth, it's talking about the city. And it doesn't say that there is no sun or moon, that has no need of sun or moon. Let's read it carefully. The city had no need of sun or of moon to shine in it. It had no need, it says. For the glory of God illuminated it, the Lamb is its light. 
So basically what's going to happen is, in the city, the light is going to be so bright that you won't even see the sun or the moon. It's like turning on a flashlight in Fresno in the month of July at 12 noon. Who's going to see the light of the flashlight? The flashlight is on, but the light can't be seen because the greater light makes it, makes it dissipate so that people cannot see it. Folks, the final conflict in this world is going to have to do with worship. There are going to be two signs. And we're going to talk later about this, the seal of God and the mark of the beast. One sign is the sign of worship to the Creator. The first angel's message says, Worship Him who made heaven, earth, the sea, and springs of water. You cannot speak about that without keeping His holy Sabbath. But there's another power known as the beast, and we're going to talk about this power later on. And there are going to be people in the world who are going to worship the beast, who obviously claims to be a counterfeit creator. He doesn't claim to be a counterfeit, but he is a counterfeit creator. Notice Revelation 14, 9 and 10. If anyone worships the beast and his image and received his mark, receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Two powers vying for the loyalty of the human race. Two signs. One created by God before sin, the other created by the man of sin. The question is, which sign will we accept? The sign that God has established, or the sign that the beast has established as a sign of his power and his authority? That's the decision that we must make. And I pray to the Lord that God will help us make the right decision.